Lisa Russell, everybody, round, round of applause. Uh, Emmy Award winning <laughs> director and She Decides Ambassador. Over to you, Lisa. So, uh, so my name is Lisa Russell and I, I work as a filmmaker, but I've had a very unique journey to becoming a filmmaker. I, I didn't go to film school. I, I actually and thought I was pursuing a global health and humanitarian aid sort of career path until I had an experience that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. But basically for the last 15 years, I've worked at the intersection of arts, social justice, and global development. Arts as a working filmmaker, full-time working filmmaker, professional filmmaker. I also curate performing art. I teach workshops. I'm a mentor. Um, as a social justice advocate, I'm, I'm through and through an activist. I do a lot of stuff around social justice issues, racial justice issues, and, and global development. I am working in the global health um, arena with UN NGO agencies. So it's a unique intersection. Um, I like to say I'm multilingual. I speak, speak, and I speak, artists speak. And so it's been an interesting place to be in for the past 15 years. And I think it's just a really exciting talk as artists and creative professionals are welcomed more into this space. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Yeah. So I started off, um, as I mentioned, getting my master's in public health. Um, if the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, working as a humanitarian aid worker in Kosovo and Albania during the 1999 conflict. And I loved my work, I loved being on the front lines, but I had a really interesting experience um, at the women in Albania where I had escorted a politician's wife named Kitty Dukakis to Albania to meet with women who were running programs for refugee women and children in the camps. And we knew they were doing remarkable work, but two of the women there were really upset. And they said, you know, really upset with the journalists who are coming into the refugee camps. And they said, they're coming into the camps. They're saying that they want to tell the story about rape being used as a tool of war, which we all know was an important story. But the way that they were conducting themselves really upset the women who were speaking. And they said they were coming into the refugee camps saying, have three days to tell the story. We need to speak to women who've been raped. Can you raise your hands if you've been raped? And that, of course, shocked yes. all of us. Said, you know, after this war, we fear that they will, people will no longer remember us as Kosovar women, but as Kosovar women who've been raped. And that was really profound for me. And I started really paying attention. And again, remember, this is pre 9 11. So paying attention to sort of the world stories about the African continent, looking at PSA coming out of the UN, and there was a clear like pattern of telling one-dimensional storylines. Um, you know, Ethiopians being victims of famine, the, you know, West Africans being victims of Ebola, Chinese being victims of the coronavirus. And so out on a journey to sort of figure out how to change the narrative of these global health stories. And I did so not from a journalistic point of view, but more from an arts and storytelling um, perspective, because I had been a dancer, I was a painter, I, you know, I drew it, I was a very artistic kid. Um, and I wanted to bring both my global health, like academic lens and my creative lens to trying to tell stories differently. And so um, next slide, please. So I basically became a self-taught filmmaker and I direct, I produce, I write, I edit, and I shoot all of my short films. And I've had a great career, um, you know, documenting and, and sharing personal stories for advocacy reasons. Um, next slide, please. And I've been lucky to have um, received contracts from a lot of the leading UN agencies and NGOs um, and, you know, have had a very fulfilling career. Simultaneously, my first film, I decided instead of trying to get my film seen on a major broadcast network station, that I would instead work with and collaborate with the musician whose um, 
music was in my film. Her name's Zat Mama. She's a Congolese Belgian artist. And instead of really doing what I think typical filmmakers who go to film school do to distribute their films, they you know look at film festivals, they try to get it on networks. I jumped on the tour bus with this musician and went around the country and did screenings in collaboration with Planned Parenthood and you know universities, UCLA. Um, we started off in Seattle, collaborating with PATH, um, and just we tried to utilize the arts as a way to get conversations started around something as serious as fistula and maternal health. And it was highly successful. I think people didn't quite know what to expect of it, but by the time we finished the tour, we had raised money, we had galvanized a whole new community of young activists, a lot of student activists from these different universities. And it set me on a path to not just make films, but to really try to collaborate with performing artists, with poets. I was a teaching artist for a poetry organization, um, DJs, beatboxers, steppers. I work with all sorts of creative help. And what I've realized is that by working with socially conscious artists in this way, it is a automatic and easy way to change the narrative of these very dense topics that we cover as global health and development specialists. So I really err towards arts and storytelling to try to reframe and take dense information and translate it to a wider audience. So next slide, please. So one of my favorite quotes is, is this one. It has been said that next to hunger and thirst, our most basic need is for storytelling. And that's been a really exciting um, thing to see the storytelling sort of movement also overlap with global health and development, which it wasn't doing as much um, you know, years ago. And I found this research, um, if, next slide please, this research study that said, and I found this so fascinating, it, a researcher was able to show that the brain waves of a storyteller line up with people who are listening to the story. So storytelling and stories have a way to connect people in a very um, you know, non-physical, um, if you want to call it spiritual, whatever um, manner. And because of that, I feel that as storytellers, we have a big responsibility to ensure that the stories we're telling are ethical and responsible and that we are you know, taking our craft very seriously. Next slide. So I went and decided, I teach workshops, storytelling workshops. I wanted to go back to actually look at what is the definition of storytelling? Because in my mind, it looks very different if I'm working as a filmmaker in the artistic film world than it does if I'm working as a filmmaker and storyteller in the global health and development arena. And so I went to the basic um, definition of what is, a, what is storytelling. And you can, you can take a look at the slide. Next slide, please. And what it helped me determine was not only what storytelling is, but also what storytelling is not. And sometimes we see a lot of messaging, we see a lot of advertising, we see anecdotes, we see campaign slogans, but that's not true storytelling. So if we're really interested in engaging artists and storytellers to care about the things that we care about, we have to rethink how we do storytelling. And um, what was I gonna say about that? Um, um, blah, blah, blah. I forget, I'm losing my train of thought. But anyway, um, so, so what these, I feel like these, these things that we see, I, I curate the Women Deliver Film Festival. I'm involved in the, uh, as a juror at the UN for the SDGs and Action Film Festival. And so sadly, I see a lot of really bad films. Um, a lot where the production value is very high. It's obvious that they spent a lot of money on the equipment, on 4K cameras, on drones or whatnot but it still like turns me off sometimes to see something where I'm pulled out of a story to have some sort of promotional message in the middle of the film where I'm just like, you, you just lost me, you completely lost me. And so I feel, and, and I, I appreciate that there's people who are taking this, you know, and looking at storytelling differently, looking at it as a craft and bringing in more professional storytellers because I think in the big picture, 
picture that's going to help all of us. And and whether professional storytellers or CEOs who make presentations at conferences or people who just share their experiences to their family and friends and community, I think understanding how to be good storytellers is paramount in us keeping sort of, you know, the interest of the, of the general public. Next slide. So I also like to say that storytellers are not just writers and filmmakers, but they are they can be curators, photographers, poets, I think are some of the best storytellers because they're able to tell a full story in three minutes or less. Same with musicians. Um, and so I have found that that engaging those various storytellers help diversify how we present our information. Um, there are, you know, there's a new term that's being used a lot called the creative economy. And a lot of, you know, it's considered to be one of the fastest growing global economies. And it's great because it encompasses so many different creative professionals. We have, you know, creative agencies that hire full-time graphic designers or art directors or whatnot. But there's also a whole community of informal or of artists who work in the informal sector. Um, and these are the, are the artists who are very close to the ground, very community oriented, very um, powerful at the local level. They reach those we call, you know, those left behind. And their voices to me are very authentic because a lot of times their art comes from a very personal place. So a lot of the young people I work with in New York who are mostly young artists of color are dealing personally with teen pregnancy, unemployment, um, lack of education, all of these issues. And so their forms become really, you know, emotional, compelling, inspirational. Um, and so those are the artists I tend to gravitate towards and work with. Um, and they also are incredible at changing narratives from one that I say um, of pity um, or of charity to provoke pity. And instead, I, I notice that they, they tend to tell stories more from a justice point of view, which promotes empowerment. So next slide, please. So, you know, according to, to this writer, we need to stop telling antidotes and we need to be better at telling stories. And I, I believe that truly. Next slide. So global health arts storytelling, I think, has a lot of opportunities and challenges. Um, if we do it well, I think that we can, enable, we can enable our community to uplift stories of struggle and resilience in a way that really attracts and engages a larger audience. But if we do it poorly, and this is, you know, our sector has been criticized by even like Saturday Night Live, like mainstream media of perpetuating what is like commonly called poverty porn or emotionally exploitative storytelling. And we know that that sometimes can work for fundraising, but is it really responsible and is it really sustainable? Next slide. So I, I did a brown bag at the UN around aging artists in the SDGs and one of uh, my UN friends came and I, I thought it was so perfect. I was like, you know, we get a lot of freedom as independent artists to speak about things in a way that we can be a little bit more emotional, we can be bold, we can be provocative. And these are things that he said, oh, so everything that the UN can't be, <laughs> it's like pretty much. So partnerships with artists can be very fruitful because we might be able to see the, say the things or speak out in a way that might not be appropriate for institutions who are liable in some ways to, to funders, to investors or whatnot, but still, you know, some things need to be said. Um, I'm not talking about calling out, you know, member states, which I can't do at the UN, but also just being able to, you know, give an activist slant to some of these issues that may not work in a formal institutional setting. Um, we can reach audiences like, you know, again, I go out and I screen my films. Yes, they're on YouTube. Yes, I go to conferences, but I'm also out at like, you know, mid at artist gatherings in, in Arusha, I'm in youth development conferences. So really trying to engage a wider audience who wouldn't normally be, you know, in the UN NGO bubble speak. We don't always need to be speaking to the converted. We need to reach 
to voices, engage new voices, I believe, if we really want to see change. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to just quickly show a two and a half minute video, Pam, if I have time. Do I have time? Uh, yeah, we have time. I'm not sure if it's going to play though, because the thing you've sent won't. Okay, we'll try okay. it. Yeah. I'll, I'll try it. There we go. Okay. It's playing. It's playing. Great. Somewhere close, a woman's hands are shaking like a tantrum under California's feet. I can feel the sea level beneath her eyes rising like temperature. This warm body of water sitting on the edge of her sight still as the calm after a flood falls like an empire. Tears running down her cheek like wildlife out of a burning habitat. Her lungs, two volcanoes sleeping under a blanket of smoke, screaming in a voice made of ashes hot enough to peel the skin off the sky. Fingers running through her scalp like chainsaws through a forest. She stretched out. Gray as a rain cloud and a hurricane. There's a landfill-sized hole buried in the layers of her heart. I can smell the methane walking out of her pores Like an alcoholic walks into the living room Body covered in bruises only a man made She cries Every day And if you ask her how to make her stop She'll tell you Ride a bike with me. Hold my hand with the lights off. Pick those poems up off the floor. Don't throw them away. Finish them. Use them over and over and over and stop moving so fast. You're gonna miss everything I made for us. Don't take me for granted. Treat me like you would treat your mother. Like I'm the only one you'll ever have. So yeah, I wanted to um, show that video um, because it was an example of two artists coming together over a topic that they cared about. And, um, and it did really well. It, it premiered during the SDG Summit in 2015 online with Slate Magazine. It's screened at the UN like three times. It's been in over 35 international film festivals. And it won an award, um, the Best Fest for San Francisco Green Fest. And even though I made it now four years ago, I still get requests for it to be screened. Um, and I just wanted to show that because it really is a, a great example of when you let artists do what they do without too much institutional like influence or push, because you notice there's no statistics, there's no, there's no messaging in it. When we distribute it, we align it with different, um, you know, campaign slogans or whatnot. It's screened during International Youth Day that had a focus on SDG number 12, with, which is responsible consumption and production. And the artist who's in the film, the poet, was able to give closing remarks, which I was told was the only time an artist has ever been given that, that platform. But what I think is most interesting about this is I shot this film in my gym. I spent $72 and I made it in two days. And um, it just, you know, it, it was truly because we were on this, you know, mission to sort of get young people of color to talk about climate change. And so this was just purely a short film. And again, it's done really well. It was very easy to make. Um, we aligned it with other organizations and institutions, but it, I just feel like it was a very good example of 
let artists do their thing. Um, next slide, please. And so, yeah, I, I joke that this is like the best title I could have asked for, for an article. Like, I would love to cut it out and just make that my resume. <laughs> that to me is like success. But, um, but anyway, uh, and next, next slide. Oh, sorry, I think I sent the wrong thing. I'll just read, I'll just cover this stuff. Um, I just wanna wrap up by saying that, that it's an exciting time and I hope there are people in the audience who are really excited and interested in engaging with artists. I think we are just scratching the surface. I think there's a lot of ethical um, considerations we need to think about. Um, another example I give is, is I was in the town hall meetings for the writing of the SDG outcome document, and it was only myself and a radio presenter from the Caribbean who was there trying to advocate to get the voices of artists into this final document. And because there were only two of us, I believe that's the reason why um, I counted. I did a word count, but there's 16,000 words in the SDG outcome document. Arts and artists are never mentioned and creativity is all mentioned twice. And when you don't have artists at sitting at the table with decision makers, you then is sort of, um, you know, sort of not really having your voice integrated. And that's a disservice, not only to artists, but to the SDG Act, you know, community, global health community. Um, we need to really answer the tough questions, not that anyone you know, thinks otherwise, but we need to figure out how to pay artists who are working in the space, because it's not like a CEO or a program director who's already got a full-time job who comes and speaks at some of these events. If you ask a young poet to read a 500-page report, write a poem, memorize it, you know, for example, get to the UN, perform it, go back home, that's like 15 to 20 hours of volunteer work that you're asking somebody who already is struggling financially. And I have ideas, if anybody wants to have that conversation, I've, I've thought through this for many, many, many years, and I have models of uh, financing that could help the creative community. I believe we need to give them a seat at the table. If you have board, you know, board of directors, consider giving it to a young person. If you are doing a panel discussion at a conference, you know, the Women in Global Health has been very successful at ensuring there's no more mantle. So let's also think about having panels that, that have artists on them, um, especially if you're asking artists to open or close uh, an event. We need to talk about intellectual property rights and trade secrets. I had a social impact brand completely steal my work stuff, and because they know I can't financially afford a legal team to fight them, they are you know, pushing forward, and that's, it's completely unacceptable in my point of view in this space. Um, we need to get rid of the tokenism that exists, like, okay, you're an artist, great, come and perform, thank you very much, and that's the only value we see in you is entertainment. And then, I, lastly, I just feel like we need to really push for intersectional uh, work when we're talking about this, because it's great if you're an artist who can afford to go to school or can afford to fly to a different country to participate in a UN uh, festival, you know, arts festival, but how do we those who are incredible? I've been in East Africa for almost five months working with local artists here, and the talent and the passion and the influence is remarkable. But these people, for example, who are struggling to pay for minutes on their phone to even be able to apply to some of these opportunities, let alone sit there and fill out a really complicated UN TOR to be able to participate. So um, I have a lot I can talk about this. I really wish I was there in person to meet everyone and, and continue the conversation. But I just wanted to share sort of, you know, again, my perspective of working in these two, um, these two communities for, for, for a while. So thank you for, for the opportunity and hopefully I'll, I'll be there maybe next year. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks. Thank you.